the, the people. But there's one particular um, organisation is now proposing to get in on social housing. I see there's some multinational firm, a uh, vulture fund of some sort, is interested in social housing. They've all become interested overnight because they see profit in it. But it shouldn't be for that, you know, it's not appropriate, I think. Sorry, you mentioned 75,000 private rented sector um, being used for social housing. I mean, my answer to that is that it's not fit for purpose. 75,000 houses. Well, we know that the private rented sector doesn't work. When the rents are being put up in a dramatic way, the standards are poor, by the way, Something like 100% of private rented homes in County Louth, and I hope I'm right, I think it's County Louth, are not conforming to normal standards. 100%. The average is something like 48%. I mentioned 50% in my paper, but it's actually 40, 48 Now, that's scandalous. So how could the private rented sector be appropriate for providing housing for for either poor people or not so poor people. It doesn't add up. Mixed income, well, I would approve of uh, housing for mixed income groups, by the way. I would approve of integration of, of housing. I think the segregation has been wrong. We built large estates in all sorts of places around Dublin and around Galway, around Limerick and Cork and so on. And that is a pity. And so we do need to integrate more. And I think the state, again, has to play the role in ensuring that that happens, if at all possible. It's not easy. It's not easy. Unfortunately, we're a segregated society. We don't like the idea that uh, private people in private estates don't like the idea of social housing. Sadly. But I think it's wrong. And so we need to move towards a model like Germany or France or the other European countries where there's much more integration and the... the the Doyle deputy lives next door to the person who's unemployed, probably paying a different rent, but they're, they're next door to each other, and they know each other, and they get on very well together, and so on. Rent regulation, did you want me to deal with rent regulation? Okay, well, basically, I've set out the arguments in the paper, in the summary. The summary is better than the other, because the other was a bit too long, actually. But basically, it's very important, first of all, to see the distinction between rent regulation and rent control. It's absolutely essential. And even this morning, I heard the word rent control used again on RTE. Again and again. And I heard Peter McFerry, who should know better, using the term last night on the Clare Byrne show. Rent control was something that was brought in during the First World War, all over the world, really, but certainly in Ireland. And it lasted up to about 19, in fact, to 1980, where you actually controlled rents. You, you froze them at a certain level, and often at a totally unreasonable level. So a house was frozen at two, uh, at two pounds in 1914, and it was still two pounds in 1970 or 1980. Now, that was control. And it was totally unreasonable, and it was found to be unconstitutional in 1981. So now, rent control is non-existent. I promise you, I plead with you not to use the term rent control because it doesn't exist in Ireland or Europe or anywhere else. Rather, what does exist is rent regulation, where rents are changed in line with inflation or in line with some other percentage, perhaps 2 or 3 percent or 5 percent, and in line with improvements to the premises. And that, to me, is entirely reasonable, and that, to me, that is the situation in quite a range of European countries. Germany is an obvious, France, Belgium, Sweden, there's a whole range of European countries that actually do this. I see Ms McCormack from the Private Landlords Association and Mr Faulkner, and they regularly probably send you emails to send them to me, uh, telling me that the world is going to fall in. There's going to be mass unemployment. There's going to be mass exit of landlords if we bring in rent regulation. I mean, the world is actually going to end. And yet, it hasn't ended in Europe. Throughout Europe, rent regulation is the norm, I promise you. And at the same time, they have good standards because 
it's insisted on, and they have security of tenure for long periods of time, indefinite in many cases. And people are delighted with this situation. So I argue that we should bring... The, the, the basic argument against our foreign rent regulation is because the so-called market is an imperfect market. It's a monopolistic type market where there are a small number of landlords or a relatively small number of landlords and a large number of tenants. Now, if you have a situation like that in, in producing any good or any service, the, the producer will charge what he or she wants. That's, that's life. That's logical. And that's what landlords do. So, really, there's no way around it. You've got to accept it is a monopolistic, it's not a perfect market, as is sometimes argued, and was argued in a DKM report last year, 2014. Uh, incorrectly, in my view, and you possibly have seen that report, which the landlords regularly use. Now, I don't want to be seen to be anti-landlord. I respect there are a lot of really good landlords, decent people, who look after their properties and don't charge extortionate rents. But there are a lot of landlords that do the opposite, including the vulture funds, who are now in here in force, and they're charging outrageous rents in my view, and they're taking over a lot of stuff, and I think it really that needs your attention. The second point I make, apart from the monop monopolistic situation, is a high rent sort of actually bad for the economy, because lots of money is spent on rent, which could be spent on other things, job creation activities. You know, if people have no money to spend on food or whatever, then the shops are suffering. So it's bad. It's bad news. Um, Rents out of line with inflation, is that, is that justifiable? I don't think it is. I don't think it's justifiable for either house prices or rents to go in the way I showed you in the diagram. It just doesn't, to me, make any sense. Why should housing, of all things, housing that's such a necessity, that's such a fundamental need, why should that, out of the blue, be different from any other product or service? It doesn't, to me, make any sense, and it's wrong. Ethical. Quite wrong. Unethical. Another point I make is uh, the deterrent to skilled workers coming. It's a deterrent to living in Dublin, the sort of rents that have been charged. And yet people have no option. So have I answered your questions at all? I, I, to increase house purchase, yeah, best to reduce. You talked about how to deal with house purchase in a better way. Yes, that's an important point. I believe that it's important, rather than giving tax incentives or giving first-time buyers grants or giving help to buy, all of those three things I've mentioned, all they do is increase house prices because they increase the demand. And some of you will remember that the first-time buyers grant was written in, do you remember, to the price of housing. Those of you who are, well, quite middle-aged. I think I'm the oldest in the room, by the way, and I, I, you know, but I'm still, I'm still here. Uh, but certainly, it's written into the price. That's the problem. So don't go that direction. Rather, try to reduce house prices. Uh, by the way, I should say, the central bank thing, I believe, is correct. Uh, because it is dampening down the demand for housing. In fact, the first house, I bought a house in Galway many years ago when I couldn't afford to buy it. And I had to get a 25% deposit. Now, I got it illegitimately by borrowing it from a bank. I got the rest of the money from a building society. I eventually went to England and spent many years in England. I couldn't pay the mortgage, actually. I was one of these subprime mortgage people, and my unfortunate sister bailed me out and paid the mortgage for me. But anyway, so it was a misguided purchase. But at the time, it was 25%. And now people are giving out hell about 20%. But the central bank thing is designed to, to put manners on the banks and to put manners on people who make seriously wrong decisions. And it's very important, really. So on, on house prices, the government takes a big take. Now, Mr. Parlin will have told you that already in detail, I'm sure. He will be giving out about the government. But the government does take a big take, and I know 
in, in Leinster House, you need the money to keep the show on the road. But certainly, a big take is taken by the government in VAT and levies and so on. So, I mean, that is an issue to be looked at. The other issue to be looked at is land. Land prices feed into high house prices. And that is an issue which we have failed to deal with over a very long time. Some of you will remember the famous Kenny report in 1973, where Kenny proposed that land should not escalate, but that the state should purchase land at its existing use value, plus 25% for compensation. The state should be purchasing land, but not at ridiculously high prices. So, but that, of course, was forgotten about. We've done nothing about land. That's an issue. Uh, now, I don't know whether I fully answered, uh, Mr. O'Brien, um, your... Thank you, Professor. Um, uh, I'll take a couple of questions here together. Deputy Durkin. Yeah, um, and thank you, Chairman, uh, and thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, Rudy, for coming in to talk with us this afternoon. Um, I would agree with many of the things that he uh, just stated, because, as we all know, we've discussed this issue for the last number of, of, of the last couple of weeks. I don't agree in, in respect of, of changing over our system to, to, to reliance on rental, private or public. And the reason so uh, I don't is because when that idea was first mooted 10, 15 years ago, and there was a switch from the local authorities over to the private rental system, and, there was a, it, and, and everybody said at the time, almost without contradiction, that this was the answer, we were going to be like the Europeans, it didn't work. And it didn't work for a variety of reasons. The people in this country uh, take personal pride in owning their own home. It's an investment for them. But the most important thing is security. Nobody can tell them to get out. Nobody can tell them to move on. Nobody can say, you, what was said at the time, we want more movement in the housing population. We don't need more movement. We need security. But I, and as you know, Chairman, we, we've all spent many years in the local authorities. Uh, where we learn from unfortunate experience. But I remember in the 80s, in the local authority I was a member of, we produce almost a thousand houses each year, 50% by way of direct build and 50% by way of the thing that hasn't been mentioned by anybody at all, the local authority loan. And at that time, the local authority loan covered the loans for the Gardaí, young Gardaí, young doctor, young nurses, young professionals, everybody. And it, were within a, it was within a certain income limits. And we had to apply at some part of those stages a certain reasonable value to prevent uh, uh, speculation and racketeering in the whole house uh, purchase and, and building business. But I, I, I remember intoning to a well-known member who would be before the committee uh, 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 in, in the charitable sector later on, 20 years ago I predicted that we would have this crisis and wrote about it at the time simply because we were now relying on, on rental property. We shifted away completely from the local authority loans and we called it social housing. Remember, it was never social housing before that. It was local authority housing, county council house, county council loan. None of this big thing. But anyway, this, this, this is what I want to suggest. That we go back, and I, I would ask you, uh, to what extent do you think it is possible to go back to that system, direct build, reliance on direct bill for a section of the market, and, and at the same time the local authority loan system. And also to remember this, at the time that you borrowed from a bank or building society, they were mutual societies at that particular time. They, 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 they weren't under competition from the banks. It was only when the banks entered the arena of lending for, for housing purposes, particularly one bank that, that came into this country and left again in a hurry, uh, that the, 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 the outrageous uh, level of offering loans started. The Bank of Scotland, as everybody knows, uh, and, and, then, and then withdrew from the scene. Gone, finished. I'll finish with this, uh, Chairman, as an example. A couple of years ago, I was involved in a voluntary housing group. Formed a company, bought the sites, from the local authority, same sites which I've said before were available to the approved housing bodies free. We paid 20,000 for them. And handed the sites, the houses finished over to the um, uh, ten owners, not tenants, owners. Uh, and the time, at that particular time, the price to them was exactly half what the houses were on the private market. Exactly half. So there has to be in there something, because remember, we had to buy them. They were bought. The, the voluntary housing bodies that have all supposed to be the, the result, solution to all our problems, they got them free from one euro, one euro per site. 
service sites. And so the, the, that whole area is gone. They had to qualify, for, obviously, for income grounds and all that kind of stuff. And I would strongly urge, and I would ask you to consider, uh, you know, that has a solution to revert back to the division uh, b between the, the, the direct build and also the local authority loans. I have no doubt in my mind that we wouldn't be where we are now if we had retained that. Thank you, Deputy. Professor, we come back to you in a moment. Uh, I'll take one or two other comments. Uh, Deputy Function. Um, yeah, thanks, Chair. I actually don't have a question. I just want to make a really brief comment. I just want to agree with what you're saying in relation to seeing it as housing as a right and not being uh, as a way of for profit, because I think something that we forget, and I'm a tenant myself and I've moved a lot in the last few years due to uh, houses being sold and stuff, but obviously I'm in different circumstances you know, than a lot of people. But I think we forget the impact that's having on, on children in terms of not just in the emergency accommodation or overcrowded, but that constant moving. It's not good for them. It's not good for their sense of identity and, and, and you know school friends and different things like that. And I just think that's an important point that you made about we have to start at what, what we see housing and whether it's a right or whether we're going to see it as you know, something that's to serve for profit, and that's kind of where we have to go from in the whole thing. But I think it's just really good to see somebody that's come into the committee saying saying that because it is so true. And I, I really think in a number of years what we're going to have difficulty um, possibly with uh, some children and mental health issues and everything after going through all of this, especially children who spend long periods of time either moving from house to house or staying in B&B &B emergency accommodation. I think you know, we probably won't see the exact fallout of that right now, but I think we will in a few years' time. I just wanted to agree with what you're saying. Thanks. Thank you, Deputy Function. Before we come to you, because there were mainly statements rather than yes. specific questions, I'll take Deputy Coppinger at this point as well, and then I'll go back to you, Professor. Um, thanks. Uh, yeah, for, I would welcome a lot of what you say about the massive increase in the private rented sector and the problems that it's caused. Um, mm -hmm. And I agree with, uh, I don't think we should get stuck in terminology. I, you always use the term rent controls. Um, I know you were <laughs> objecting to it, but uh, years before, I've been calling for rent controls for a few years, but um, it is a term that's used that way in Europe as well. So, um, but I agree generally with your concept of what rent controls or regulation should be. It has to be in some way linked with inflation. Um, and in actual fact, if we froze rents, that wouldn't end the problem. We actually have to decrease rents because the rents now are 1,400 to 2,000 euro in parts of Dublin. So I also agree with the massive negative impact on the economy. And I really can't understand how this isn't grasped by the government because uh, it isn't just people in social housing or on the social housing list. And no matter how many times you say it, often you're accused of not caring about people who are, wouldn't qualify for our current social housing list, actually, which is probably the biggest group. And even if people are meeting their payments, just think of a young family paying €1,400 Euros in rent every month. The impact on their children, you know, the, lack, the way that they can't spend money on their children, you know, like dance lessons and sports and the things that other people take for granted. There, you know, a lot of children are, are, are suffering in those ways as well. The strain on families paying that every month, you know. Um, I just say I, I totally agree that it is also acting as a huge... I know a lot of migrants to this country that have emigrated from this country, actually. They're gone to Britain, they're gone to Scotland, they're gone to all sorts of places because they simply cannot understand how nothing is being done about this situation. And... You know, you do tend to get migrants. I, we have a very big migrant population in West Dublin. Very stuck in the private rented sector and, and actually more prey to becoming homeless as well. So just some of the issues that you, you bring up, maybe just some questions. Um, you mentioned the debate that took place in government over rent controls, right, or rent regulation, whichever term. Um, and you make the point in your submission that... Uh, you believe it was down to pressure exerted from vested interests, you know, page four. And you give a couple of examples of uh, an American company that, you know, now controls a huge part of the rental market. Um, 
So, are, can you expand on that? And are you saying that that was the main reason that the last government didn't bring in the kind of rent controls that everybody knows are needed? Well, everyone who's suffering them knows. Rather than the legal, stroke constitutional obstacles that were cited by, and I know you give credit to Alan Kelly, I'm not arguing about that, but Alan Kelly came in here, the minister came in and argued that it was legal reasons. So can you maybe, like any said, that we need a grown-up conversation about Article 43, I think it was, of the Constitution? Um, could you also maybe comment, you, you make a lot of points about house prices and rents, and some of the figures are shocking and, and very useful, like in Dublin, about the house price increases all over the country, but in, in Dublin in particular, the ratio of, um, of house prices to average earnings is now 9.3 to 1. I mean, that is just shocking. Like, so the idea that anyone can afford to buy a house, even people with relatively good jobs, certainly the average industrial wage even. Um, so, so much for our great attachment to home ownership. But can you expand on why house prices and rents have gone up so much, in your opinion? Like, how much of that is due to profiteering? Um, and the reason I raise this is, arising from this committee's findings, I'm, I'm sure some sort of house building will be recommended. But one of the things that I would be concerned about is that, I, I think as others have alluded to, we need, in my opinion, to have councils directly building housing themselves because a lot of the profiteering onto the cost of a house is because of private developers. And um, there wouldn't be a guarantee, you know, that they will provide affordable housing. Um, yeah, sorry, just lastly, the, there's a lot of questions, but I won't go into them all. But in Social Housing 2020, that's what it's called, isn't it, the government? Yeah, yeah sorry, yeah, SH 2020, I'd written down, forgot the name. You, you say you welcome the fact that they're building 35,000 houses over... Um, five years, but they're not actually building 35,000 houses, unfortunately. Um, what they're doing is, and I think it's important people know this, because if, if there was new houses being built, obviously that in itself, although I don't even think that would be enough, by the way, and I would point out during the boom, 80,000 houses were built a year, so the idea that we must do it at a piecemeal pace, there, it would mean that people would be waiting 10 years for a house, and we, we shouldn't have that kind of... I'm not saying we should build wrong estates or anything like that, but we have to have a sense of urgency. But actually, a lot of... I won't go into it, but most of those 35,000 are actually the acquisition of social housing units that we've seen in the last number of years. Thank you, thank you. Like, like the HAPS and the RAS and all of those. OK. Uh, Professor, there were a number of uh, co general comments, but there was uh, a couple of specific questions. And just, I just want to add to one point that Deputy Coppinger made. She was talking about uh, the rent regulation and the, the, you know, in terms of the vested interest that you you have written about, and you might comment specifically. But in particular, in, you you set out some recommendations, and they're always very useful to the committee. But the last recommendation you have specifically, and. Um, was that the right to housing should be enshrined in legislation and in the constitution. And on that point specifically, uh, we had well, two, 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 two parts to it. One is, would that have had a different effect in terms of rent regulation and what the minister might or might not have been able to do? And secondly, when we had the minister here a number of weeks ago, he quite clearly said he felt restricted in what he could do in terms of the vacant property site tax. And would those issues, would he have more scope, would he have had more scope had the right to housing been enshrined in the Constitution? And finally, uh, in terms of land, you yourself make the point, a substantial land tax or capital gains tax should be imposed on unearned prices, uh, on price increases on land that's zoned for housing and so forth. And I suppose I favour the approach of a tax rather than the capital gains in the sense that uh, we're trying to encourage activity rather than waiting for something to occur and then charge a, a tax on it. But would those issues be easier addressed with your, what you're suggesting in terms of the Constitution? Professor. Well, yes. I, I suppose having the right built in 
it, it wouldn't guarantee anything, but it would uh, compel or influence government to really take the matter seriously. Which they, it would change the philosophy, really, which is the fundamental issue. But I, even even as it stands, the constitution does have, and I think. Uh, Deputy Coppinger mentioned, is it 43 or 42? I, I keep forgetting. But basically, the current, uh, there are two items in the Constitution, the existing Constitution, which says really you must to take uh, social, uh, the wording is escaping me at the moment, but basically that the, the state would be entitled in the interests of the common good to take particular actions. So, I mean, I believe myself that the Constitution is not bad as it stands. In the interest of social justice is the other key point, that the state can intervene in the interest of social justice and in the interest for the exigencies of the common good, I think is the phrase they use. Uh, so even without, and I, I, I'm in disagreement with Mr. Kelly on that one, really, because I don't think he, he need necessarily, he has to have a new constitution written. I believe the existing situation, because the con constitutional change, as you all know, is very difficult to achieve. Once you have a referendum, my God, all sorts of cans of worms will be taken out and thrown around. So, I mean, a constitutional change is difficult, but legislation, legislative change is much easier because you people are in charge. And you could bring in legislation tomorrow morning or very quickly, which enshrines the right to housing, at least in legislation. And therefore, if a person is on the street for a very long time, the state would be compelled to take action of one kind or another, either by providing uh, local authority housing, as Deputy Durkin says, or by ensuring that the person has a private rented situation at the right price, the right standard and security of tenure. So the state would be compelled in a way, cajoled, encouraged, whatever the word is, to do the right thing. So I, I, I believe that I don't accept that constitutional... It's, it's that, that red herring, to be honest with you, has been thrown out since the early 1980s. I became embroiled in planning issues and so on, early 1981, 82. And the constitutional protection of private property was thrown out constantly. We must not interfere with private property. But the two items, the two articles in the Constitution I've just mentioned, are there. And in fact, if you look back at a Supreme Court case, Back in 1982, one of the Supreme Court judges specifically referred to the need to take these two articles into account. So the courts, I believe, would be very sympathetic to the right to housing if it was in legislation. I don't think you need to have a constitutional change. I, don't, I hope I've answered your yes, question. You have, and the other issues, sorry, I didn't mean to take that point. All right, well, Mr. Durkin raised uh, the whole range of, and I happen to agree with really practically everything he says, and everything he says. He's unhappy with the private rented sector. Well, we're in certainly in agreement with that. It hasn't worked, and as you said, it was handed over foolishly to the private rented sector. I agree with him absolutely on the idea of the local authority loan was a great idea, and loans were given at a reasonable a mortgage level, very, very reasonable, and the loans were paid back and people loaned their own. And I have no difficulty with people loaning their own homes. I think it's an ideal in many ways. But unfortunately, some people po cannot possibly afford the way prices have gone. I'd love everybody to own their house. And I'd love every house to be less than 100,000 today. Every house. I don't care how elaborate they are in Fox Rock or wherever. Uh, the local authority bills completely agree with you. Interesting, you raised the certificate of reasonable value. I agreed with that, but it was eliminated. It was difficult to administer, but nevertheless, it was a good idea. And so the, the, the builder who was going to charge an outrageous price for a house was under surveillance. And he was told, look, that is totally unreasonable. You're demanding a profit of 50% or something when you should only get about 10% or 15%, Mr. Wallace will tell me what the right figure should be. But certainly 50% or whatever is ridiculous. It's mad. So, you know, local authority housing, good idea, yes. And I think you're right to refer to it as local authority housing, which it was. I have no problem. Direct build, absolutely agree. And I agree with the loans from local authorities. It should be reinstated. Why not? Why not? And then, then the banks will maybe have some manners because they have no manners at the present time. Uh, building societies were mutual. Yes, indeed. Then suddenly the Irish permanent became 
whatever it became, with the gentleman in charge who got into some bother uh, way back. Some of you won't remember, but he did. And the Irish Parliament became a, he flogged it off, you see, he flogged it off as, as the rest of them did, flog off. And people were inveigled to agree with it by getting a few hundred quid or some sort, some sort of shares. But that was the mutual idea is gone and it should come back. Voluntary housing, I agree with it, it, it they should be providing much more. And the idea of sites, I think you suggested that sites should be made available, good idea. And cooperative housing, why not? So there's quite a range of, in, your, in your contribution, Deputy Durkin, that you know, are very useful. Uh, Deputy Function, I mean, I think you, you commented, and I happen to agree with all you said, the issue of children and so on being so badly treated is, is appalling. Uh, Deputy Coppinger, well, um, decrease rents, I'd actually agree with you. It would be difficult to do, but I'd agree with you because they're too high. They're just far too high. And uh, it's wrong. And they're having a negative impact on the economy, as you said. You mentioned children and um, families suffering. Yes. And migrants, of course, in a particularly vulnerable position, suffering very badly. There's no excuse for it. So you mentioned then the debate in government and about the pressure from the, um, the private um, rented people, in particular Kennedy Wilson. And a letter went to the Department of Finance. You may be familiar with that letter. Uh, putting pressure on Mr Noonan and his advisers that the world would cave in and that the market should not be interfered with. They didn't, of course, accept my point that the market is an imperfect monopolistic market, but the argument was strong. There was two or three pages of a letter, I understand, and arguing that under no circumstances should the government introduce rent regulation. And Mr Noonan was persuaded, I think, and Mr Kenny, the Taoiseach, were persuaded by it. And I suppose it would be fair to say, or maybe unfair to say, that really the philosophy uh, of perhaps Fine Gael, and to some extent the Labour Party, would be, you know, would not want to do anything radical. I think you do have to do something fair. Maybe I'm wrong, <laughs> Deputy, and you'll, you'll correct me if I'm wrong. But really, I would hope, whatever, it doesn't matter about the past, Annie, it doesn't matter what I say. What is important is to get it right in the future. And I, anyway, a compromise was reached. To, you know, you change the rinse every two years. So, I mean, that's a, that's a joke. Because, obviously, landlords can escalate the rent after two years, so that doesn't make any sense. There were a number of other little bits and pieces in the changes that were useful, but that was the fundamental problem. The issue of rent regulation, it should be rent regulation that's going to go on. And you might get rid of it in five years' time, but certainly at the present time, rent regulation of the kind that I'm talking about, with rents being tied either to inflation or a small percentage, or in accordance with uh, improvements to the properties is, in my view, essential. Um, you raise the issue of the constitutional problem. I think I've, I've tried to deal with that, and I hope I've answered it. I don't believe there's a constitutional problem. I don't accept that there is. I think the constitution is good as a Stan de Valera, whatever his faults. I'll tell you, I think he got that one fairly right. Now, it's, it's not as strong as I would like, but it's not bad. Why have house prices risen so much? Well, there's a whole range, really. Um, one thing that would drive your constituents probably completely mad would be that if you were to decide to impose a capital gains tax on the principal residence. So I won't suggest it to you. I think it'll go down very badly, but it's a possibility, you know. That really would dampen down prices. The property tax should have dampened down prices but doesn't seem to have done so. If you look at any of the national newspapers any day, it's scary because there seems to be very little under a million. And to me, I just find it very depressing. I have a son in private rental sector in, in Dublin, paying a very high rent. He has avoided buying because he's, I can't afford to buy. I have a daughter in the private rented in London. Can you imagine what's going on in London? So I'm very familiar with it and really, um, but house prices, why have they risen so much? Well, certainly during the boom, and I pointed out here, I would call this part of the diagram, I would call it super normal profits. The difference between 
the consumer price index and the, the top line there. I would call that very considerable profits. I'd also say the cost of land is a critical issue. You asked me about why house prices rose so much. Uh, the cost of land is a key issue. And I would say government policy has something to do with it, as I said earlier. Uh, government policy undoubtedly takes levies and takes uh, VAT and so on. So there's a, quite a big take by the government. And it's difficult for any government to pull back from that because you need the money to run the country. I mean, there's no, I don't dispute that. But certainly one needs to look at land, one needs to look at the, and one needs to look at super normal profits. Are developers asking too much? That's the question. Uh, you know, uh, I've heard figures bandied around of 39, 40,000 profit needed on a home of 300,000. Is that reasonable? It may be, I, it may be but certainly that 300,000 to me is far too expensive for a home. Far too expensive for most normal people. So the trick must be to bring down house prices. Obviously supply. One of the keys, and I accept the, the issue, many, many people say supply, 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 but there are more to it than supply. It's also the central bank thing will dampen down demand and stop people making crazy decisions, buying houses that they cannot possibly afford. But supply is important, so we need to escalate the supply of private housing and social housing. Absolutely escalate it. I, I cannot, we have only 12,000, I think we produced 12,000 private houses last year. Now that's very small, and as you said, something like 80 or 90,000 were produced in 2006. We were capable of doing it in 2006, why not now? And if the private sector doesn't do it, the state should do it. That would be my view. Um, the social housing strategy, the, the houses are not being built, yes, unfortunately. I do not know what is going on. I do not know what is going on, but it's, it's, it's pathetic because the social housing strategy was in 2014. Now, apparently, Minister Kelly had all sorts of problems getting the local authorities to build. I don't know. They said they had the money. I, only you can answer that. In the middle of investigating some of that. Right. Well, that's important. I mentioned, I, I dealt with the constitutional situation, I think. And all right, I take your, Chairman, I take your point about uh, tax rather than capital gain. I think that was a fair point you made. Okay. You know, okay. don't have a problem. Th thank you, Professor. I'm, I know time is moving on, so I'm going to take the remaining contributions together and then you might respond to those. Right, no problem. Uh, Deputy Butler. And thanks, um, thanks, Professor, for your presentation and your thoughts. Um, just two quick questions. Um, we've had quite a lot of, um, you know, different, the different groups and organisations coming into us, and, and a lot of them are making different proposals and suggestions, and we're trying to take them all on board and see what would work and what would not work. Now, three of the groups that came in, um, and obviously they were, they were the construction side of it, they have suggested a reduction in the VAT from 13.5% to maybe 9%. And they are teaming this, I suppose, to the to the boost that the tourism industry got when similar was happened, which I know is completely different. But you know, and just your thoughts on that, whether you think that would be good or bad. I think I know your answer already. But and the second question is. Um, in your opinion as well, the role of bedsits. I visited um, a hostel in Waterford, um, that's my constituency, last Friday week. It's the Vincent de Paul Hostel, where 43 men live. And it's a fabulous hostel. It actually won an award for architecture. It's, it's not long built, but it, it, it's a fantastic building. And I spoke in depth with him about how we could solve, you know, how they can move on people out of the hostel when they're, when they're stable enough to leave. And, you know, and a lot, he, he, his opinion was, that there needs to be bedsits built again, that the role of bedsits um, is very vital because a lot of these people um, wouldn't have the facilities or the wherewithal, you know, to, to, to rent uh, a two-bed or a three-bed home, but he felt that if there was a provision of bedsits in certain areas that maybe some of these, the, these men might be able to, to move back out and be in, independent living all over again. So just your thoughts on, on that as well, please. Deputy, Deputy Wallace. Thanks, Sir uh, thanks very much for your contribution and your better fresh air. I think we probably should, you should be made a housing ministry, housing minister, and uh, it'd be interesting to see how, how uh, that would work. Um, clearly, I think we were all in agreement that uh, the 
manner in which we supply housing is dysfunctional and has failed. Um, and obviously there's a few uh, huge big elephants uh, like land banking where uh, successive governments have refused to tax it and uh, it has played a major role in the price of the house here. But there's, there is a whole lot of other factors as well. Do you not think, uh, I mean, it, it, cost, it costs you less than half uh, to buy a house uh, uh, outside of a city in Europe as it would in a city in Ireland. And uh, there's, I'm just wondering, how do you think, as a committee here, um, how do we challenge uh, the the the, uh, the, fi the 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 favourite approach of the government for many years has been not to regulate, has been to leave things uh, ramble on. In other words, they have really the, the the philosophy has been dominated by the tendency to leave things to the markets and. Uh, and as you, you raise the issue of the argument made about not interfering with the markets, and it was just, I, I, just, I seen that letter that Kennedy Wilson wrote to Noonan, and you'd be interested to hear that they also, when they were getting the permission to build 160 apartments in Clancy Barracks, uh, they wrote to the planning authority and said that this site wasn't suitable for social housing, and surprise, surprise, there's none going in it. And uh, when the uh, vulture funds are telling us uh, where we should put social housing and where we shouldn't put it, we've obviously got a serious problem. And uh, the planning department probably needs to look at itself too. Um, but there's a serious lack of regulation. There's a serious lack of political will uh, to do things different and to challenge uh, the power uh, and influence of vested interests as this is directly linked to the lack of regulation. We don't regulate because we are under the thumb of uh, serious power and influence in this whole area. I'm just wondering how you think we as a committee should challenge that. And just to add, your point about selling the stock of social housing, it is so brain dead idea. Uh, in Britain, we don't do research here uh, of the same nature as they do in Britain, but they've examined what happened to the uh, to the social housing stock that was sold over the last 30 years in Britain, and they have found that over 40% of it has ended up in the hands of big landlords who are actually renting it back to people who are getting a rent supplement from the state in order to be able to uh, live in it. So it's been a completely failed policy, yet we've just introduced it again here. And as if we didn't know we had housing problems for the last five years. So I suppose, anyway, uh, my main question is, uh, what do you think uh, we need to do and, and to be successful to challenge, uh, for want of a better word, but the neoliberal thinking that has uh, been such a cancer to how we do housing? Thank you, Deputy. And the final contribution, and then it'll be back to you, Professor. Deputy Harty. Thank you, Professor. Just on a slightly different tack, um, what, would you, what is your view on the lopsided economic recovery and the lopsided development in our greater cities as opposed to our, our rural counties in relation to the housing problem? Um, as people move into cities and jobs and investment are concentrated in cities, and it's most acute in Dublin, surely that is contributing to the housing difficulty as well, because so many people are moving into our, our cities and into Dublin in particular. Um, I think it was uh, Mr. Alan Moran, uh, former um, secretary to the Department of Finance, wrote last week that if, if we want to concentrate our resources resources to reach the greatest number of people. We need to concentrate our population in cities where you, you can get raw broadband, you can get road infrastructure, you can get transport infrastructure concentrated, you can concentrate the development of housing, schools, uh, and trying to invest in rural Ireland is probably not the way to go. It's economically unviable to, to maintain rural Ireland. What would your views be on, on, on that? Well, that concludes, Professor, the questions from uh, colleagues, and it's over right. to you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think it was Deputy Butler started off and uh, suggested, it has been suggested, I suppose, to reduce the VAT to 9%. I don't think I'd have a problem with that, really, because if, but I, I would worry that 
the same prices might be asked for the house. As long as, as, long as it had the, you know, that it showed up in the house price. So the, anything that happens has to reduce house prices or maintain them, you know. I mean, otherwise it's no use. Uh, now, bed sits, well, I realise this has been uh, suggested many, on many occasions and all sorts of reductions in standards have been proposed, but at the end of the day, standards are very important. Now, the bed sit idea, I think, um, well, I would just worry about it because I don't want to go back. I'd prefer to have good standards for everybody. And, I mean, I think the bed sit, which has the bathroom, the argument was put this morning, I think, that the bathroom could be out on the corridor and that everything would be fine. And really that there were, to all intents and purposes, um, single uh, occupancy. But, I mean, I would prefer to maintain standards and get them at the right price, of course, and with regulated rents. Uh, Deputy Wallace was next to commented in detail on the lack of regulation, and I happen to agree with them. At the end of the day, if you think back to the crash, it was due to rack, lack of regulation. The banks weren't regulated, the builders weren't regulated in the prices they could charge. There was virtually no, there was light touch regulation. The central bank closed its eyes, and the, the other gentleman who left with a large sum of money, he closed his eyes. I won't mention his name, but you know who I'm talking about. I mean, really, it was very tragic. So the state closed its eyes to the lack of regulation. Now, it would be fair to say that that lack of regulation started with none other than Bill Clinton in the United States, who changed the law in the United States, which had the Glass-Steagall Act had been introduced in the 1930s, and Clinton now, he had been influenced by a whole range of people, but he actually changed the legislation back to deregulation and light-touch regulation. And, of course, we followed suit. Maggie Thatcher and Ronald Reagan went in a big way for deregulation, and we followed suit. We tend to ape what others do, sadly. But the lack of regulation is a fundamental problem, and we must have regulation. I mean... We have regulation on the streets, we have traffic lights, we cannot go through a red light. Surely to God it makes sense. We cannot poison people with food. There are regulations there, they're all over the place. Child labour is regulated in this country. A hundred years ago it wasn't. It was wrong. So we have to have regulation. And we have to have regulation in relation to housing. So, uh, you mentioned political will lacking, I would say you're right. Unfortunately, over the years, somehow, you know, I think most Doyle deputies mean well. Most of them really mean well, but they kind of say it's very hard to do, it's very difficult. It's, you know, I can understand. It's very difficult to achieve change. And you're going against the grain and you have vested interests constantly on your doorstep. I can imagine you people work very hard. You have people constantly coming to you trying to twist your arm. Now, I'm trying to twist your arm today, but I, I don't think you'll pass much. I don't think you'll pass much. You've been invited. But really, at least I've been invited. <laughs> but I can imagine the, the vested interests are on your cases all the time, and it's very, very difficult for you. And so it would take great courage and great political change of philosophy, really. Um, Selling local authorities, you mentioned, well, I happen to agree completely with you that in, in England, the sales of local authorities, the sales happen to go into the hands of private landlords. It's, some, it's, it's, it's appalling, really. It's unthinkable. So the British, the British um, example is certainly not one to follow. Not one to follow at all, because they've flogged off all the social housing. At least they give a good deal of them to the housing associations, but it's a very unsatisfactory situation. And the private rental sector is worse, probably, than it is here. Uh, Deputy Harty, uh, lopsided development, I absolutely and completely and entirely agree with you. We have failed miserably in this country for many, many years to have a serious urban and regional policy where activity is spread throughout the country in a reasonable way. So we should be really, I mean, we had the spatial strategy. We first of all, go back, you're too young to remember this, but go back to 1969, the famous Buchanan report suggested nine growth centres. And 
a load of Dáil deputies at the time said, oh my God, you can't have just nine. We want one in Westport, we want one in, in Bally Go Backwards, we want one in French Park, where I come from. It's a tiny village. We want a growth centre in my place. And so it died. But we, then we had the National Spatial Strategy, which suggested much the same thing. But we haven't really implemented these things. So we have to have a, a policy which spreads economic activity throughout the country and persuades firms to locate there. And, and so, I mean, you have to build up urban centres outside the main, outside Dublin. But also, rural development is absolutely critical. Agriculture is a fundamental operation in this country. You cannot ignore it. But the rural villages are dying on the feet. And that needs attention. I've written a paper on that, by the way, if you want it, for, for what it's worth. Uh, anyway, but I agree with you. Uh, Non-viable rural areas, I don't accept it. I think rural areas could be very viable. So it's an unfair argument. Professor, uh, thank you, uh, first of all, for your attendance this afternoon and uh, your written submissions to the committee. As I said, they will be on the, the website. But I suppose you're very frank and direct and forthright answers to a range of questions. Uh, so thank you for your attendance today. Uh, we'll suspend for a couple of moments and we'll change to the next Can I thank, thank you. you all for having me, first of all, and for interesting questions and important questions and indeed comments. And I, I wish you well. You deserve to get on well this morning. I, if anybody hasn't seen this, I'll leave it. I think Fergus knows of it years and years ago. Fergus and I met about this. But I... OK, colleagues, we're back in public session. Um, and I'm pleased to welcome this afternoon the Mercy Law Resource Centre, uh, represented by Maeve Regan. Uh, the centre has submitted a full submission. Um, Copies have been circulated after the meeting. It will obviously be on the committee's website. Uh, so I'd now invite Ms Regan to summarise the submission and make an opening statement. And you've seen the procedure. Colleagues will then ask you a number of questions. Thanks, and thank you for your attendance. Th thank you, Chair. Um, uh, well, first of all, we'd, we'd like to say thank you very much for the invitation to present to the committee. We, we really welcomed the establishment of this committee. It's very important, and a cross-party approach is definitely crucial. Um, so we thank you for the invitation. Um, and we're very glad of this opportunity. Um, Mercy Law Resource Centre is an independent law centre and we provide free legal help for people who are homeless or facing homelessness. Um, we have legally advised and represented, uh, represented over 3,900 individuals and families um, who were facing homelessness since we were established just seven years ago. Uh, the particular focus of the presentation today uh, is based on a report that we launched last week, which we've been working on, in fact, for approximately two years. But we launched a report that I think you have uh, on the right to housing in Ireland. Um, and it was, in fact, um, Mr uh, Drury did actually talk about this a little bit in relation to the right to housing. So it's, um, we're very glad to hear his endorsement of the idea of protecting the right uh, in a much more formal way. We launched the report uh, at a time, as this committee is very well aware, uh, of a desperate crisis in homelessness. And in what we're speaking about, we are talking about homelessness and we're talking about uh, what we consider would be a very important protection against this kind of crisis happening again. We haven't seen a crisis in homelessness like this since the foundation of the state. We haven't seen such a thing. Um, and just to put it in a, a brief context, um, the uh, crisis in homelessness appears to have in some ways been, become evident in the early months of 2014 and it's grown month on month since then. And so between December 2014 and 2015, just as a snapshot, there was a, a net increase in the number of people who were homeless of 1,700 people, which is an increase of 43% and that was just in one year. And according to the most recent figures that we've, we've noted in our report, in February 2016, 5,811 people were homeless, 3,930 were adults who were homeless, 912 were families who were homeless, and 1,881 children were homeless. Um, President Michael D. Higgins, in a recent address about the crisis and homelessness, described it as the most pressing of all the manifestations of inequality in Ireland, nothing less than a fundamental challenge to the legitimacy of institutions and morality of the state. Um, and that's the context that we are, uh, we launched this report and, and made this uh, proposal in a very grounded way. There is no right to housing in Irish law. And the report that we launched 
assessed the protection of the right to housing in Irish law and outlines the impact that a constitutional right to housing would have. Uh, the crisis that we are seeing, and, and in watching this committee work, we're hearing it over and over again, that the crisis that we are seeing is due to a failure in policy. Uh, the, in our view, in what we are seeing, the protection of the right to housing would be a positive, strong step for the future to create enduring fundamental protection, enduring fundamental protection of home for every adult and child. And as a centre, we're calling for the protection of the right to housing in the Constitution to be a key priority of the next doll. So this invitation has been most welcome to discuss this and, and, and tease it out. Uh, a right to housing in the Constitution would not mean the right to a key to a home for all. A constitutional right to housing would, however, put in place a basic floor of protection. Uh, it would require the state in its decisions and in its policies 